Welcome to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to bring you a special message from the Word of God. Turn, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to uh, again, for one more session, uh, suspend our verse-by-verse study through First and Second Timothy to take a look at a special message. We have done that around Christmas and uh, just before the old year wrapped up. And now that we've begun a new year, uh, I want to take a look at this passage of Scripture, the Lord's laid on my heart for today, and a simple uh, title called Christian living, Christian living. You know, sometimes we get so tied up in the particulars that we don't take a look at the broader picture. What should our life look like? Uh, How are we to uh, live out our life on a daily basis? And uh, that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about Christian living. And uh, we'll read the first 12 verses. Stand with me if you're able and follow along at the reading of God's Word, beginning in the first verse of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For we know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles who know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, uh, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another, and indeed you do it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we command you, that we may walk honestly toward them that are without and that ye may have lack of nothing. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for this passage of Scripture today. Lord, may may our minds and our hearts be wrapped around your word to draw out of it Uh, that which you feed to us through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. May we accept that which you give us, understand that it's from you, and may we apply it in our lives in the days ahead. Bless each one who has come uh, to study your word today, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. Christian living, if you will. Um, And this passage, of course, um, comes in a letter that was written to the saints at Thessalonica. Um, uh, The church of Thessalonica is mentioned in chapter 1 and verse 1. The saints, those who have been saved by the grace of God. And in chapter 3 and verse 10, which we did not read, um, we find, because it says, furthermore, in the first word in chapter 4 and verse 1, furthermore adds on to something, and uh, it's a word that means finally, and it's added on to uh, that which is brought up uh, there at the end of chapter 3 in verse 10, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. The last verse we read in our passage we're looking at today in verse 12 of chapter 4 It says at the end, and that ye may have lack of nothing. Verse 10 again, to perfect that which is lacking in your faith. And verse 12 at the end, that ye may have lack of nothing. 
And I believe, like the, the, the Thessalonians, that we probably have things which are lacking in our faith. We all do. Uh, if we didn't have things lacking in our faith, we'd be perfect like God. But we're not perfect like God. We're far from perfect. And as good as, as we think we might be, and as diligent as we might apply ourselves to living out the scriptures in our lives, we're not going to get there. We will be perfect when God glorifies our body, either as he takes us out of the ground or raises us up off of the earth when he comes in the air to take us home. He will then change our body into a glorified body, and then we will be perfect, but not until. Yes, he's put righteousness on our account, but we're not very good sometimes at exercising his righteousness. Amen? So he entrusts that with us. It comes through the gospel. We understand that. But things are lacking in our faith like they were lacking in the faith of the Thessalonians. And so at the end of verse 12, he says in chapter 4, these things are written that you have, may have lack of nothing. In other words, the goal is to go from lacking to lacking nothing. We're not going to get there until the end, but there's a journey from now until the day the Lord takes us home. And during that journey, that is what I call Christian living. What are we to do from this point on as we go into, and it's a good time to look at it. There's nothing magical about the beginning of a new year. Um, in, in God's eyes, there is no time because he is eternal. And so a clock and a calendar is something that we keep an eye on. Uh, but the Lord is timeless, if you will. And so we, we seemingly take a look at things by that which we value. We value time and the calendar. We all make appointments. We all have a way of keeping track of those things. And as we go into a new year, we celebrate that. And the world celebrates it in a way where they partake of a spirit other than capital S, Holy Spirit. Um, much of the celebration is done at the beginning of the year by the world is turning over a new leaf, making resolutions, and doing all kinds of things. But the believer should look to the scriptures with more diligence to understand how we can mature in our Christian walk from where we were last year. And we should do that. And this helps us. It gives us some direction and guidance. There's nothing new here. And that's really the good news. There's nothing new. But as God gives his word to us today, something, something may spark an interest or spark a realization that, yeah, that's something that I lack. And so that should be something that we would give our attention to, to drive forward to accomplish God's will in our life in the days ahead. And because we see in verse three, for this is the will of God. And so we know that the will of God is found in the word of God. Now, first, um, I just want to give you a, a, an introduction. I did put in the bulletin an outline of the message. This is three Sundays in a row. I've never done this before ever in, in the ministry that I've been involved in. But um, the Lord has, has allowed me to do that, and, or I've taken the effort to put forth an effort to do it. I don't know which it is, probably a combination of the two. But by way of an introduction, uh, you see in your, your outline there that, and it's just getting the text that we have in context. So we don't take it out of context. But in chapter one, what we find is uh, Paul addresses the church at Thessalonica uh, with a model church. And we see that in verses six and seven of chapter one. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that ye were literally an example to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. So first we need to receive the word. It says there in, um, it says there in verse 6, you became followers because you put faith in Christ, because you received the word of God, and you did that despite all the trouble in your life. You're still enduring, and that's what uh, the Lord expects of us. There will be trials in our life. It's not just a rosy picture regarding our circumstances. It is concerning our peace that we have as we endure those. So he commended the Thessalonians for enduring um, with patience 
and the peace of God through the afflictions, having received the word of God. And then in verse seven, going on so that in so doing, they became an example to all the others in the area. That's where we ought to be. We ought to live our lives in such a fashion that God would consider us, not that we would consider us, but that God would consider us as an example to others. And then we would be part of that model church, if you will. In chapter two, the model servant was uh, described and part of that thrust is given in the first couple of verses of chapter two. Uh, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance, Paul talking about his ministry there at Thessalonica, about our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain, that it wasn't worthless, it was actually valuable and fruitful. But even after we had suffered before and were shamefully treated, as you at Philippi were bold in our God, to speak unto, the, speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. So Paul, was his service was despite the opposition, he continued to proclaim the word of God. And he did that even though he was drugged by the heels out of synagogues. He was stoned almost to death. At least on one occasion, he was beaten, ridiculed, shamed, and accused of blasphemy and all kinds of wrongdoing when in fact he was performing the will of God. And in verse 3, he said, our exhortation was not of deceit. We didn't come to deceive. That's the work of the devil. Uh, Nor of uncleanness, if you will, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God. So if we are going to walk as a model servant, we're going to do that which pleases God, not that which pleases man. And then in chapter 3, Paul talked about the model believer. And in the first two verses, he said, When we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our literally our fellow worker, fellow laborer, in the gospel of Christ to establish you, to comfort you concerning your faith, to establish and comfort. Timothy was that model uh, servant, if you will, who then went on as a, a believer who, got, who Paul had trusted in order to give benefit to those at Thessalonica. So it's with that background that we enter chapter four, and I call this first section just living in general. Because the word there, furthermore, at the beginning means finally. Uh, And it's not based on the previous, but it's an end to that. Paul gave us some instruction in the first three chapters, and then he goes to apply that to how we should live our lives. And these first 12 verses do that very succinctly. And so first, how we ought to please God. We saw that uh, over there in chapter uh, 2. But in verse 1 of chapter 4, Furthermore, or finally then, we beseech you, brethren, and this beseeching is a strong encouragement, an urging, if you will. We beseech you, brethren, and exhort you, that makes it even stronger when it's repeated, by the Lord Jesus, understanding the command comes from the Lord and not from Paul, and we Speak, Paul speaking of his co-laborers that we mentioned earlier, that as you have received of us how you want to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. As you've received how you want to live your life, do it. No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say as you have received of us, and that is through the gospel. And of course, the gospel wasn't written at that time. The revelation of the gospel was being given through Paul at that time. And so Paul, in giving of the gospel, was reminding them that they had received how they ought to live their lives in this world. And he didn't, the the exhortation and urging wasn't to go do it, but it was to go abound more and more. Now, if you're going to abound more and more, the phrase literally means an overflowing. So if you were to try to, to... Maybe take your favorite candy. Maybe it's M&M's and you try to, you're going to give somebody a cup full and you sort of leveled off at the top. No, no, no. If you're going to be generous, you're going to pour it so it's just flowing over. There's a guy that used to give us barbecue, we went to his uh, shop and bought barbecue sandwiches. 
Ken's Barbecue back in uh, Chesapeake, Virginia. And he would just, he would take and make a barbecue sandwich. When you got it to your, uh, when you got it, it was wrapped up, when you got it to the table where you're sitting or wherever, and you unfold the paper, this stuff just comes pouring out of the sandwich. The, the bread couldn't contain the amount of barbecue he put on there. And we loved going there because his barbecue was good. It was an added bonus that he gave us so much more. So he served every barbecue sandwich with a fork. So you could take and eat your sandwich, and then you got a whole other plate of barbecue to eat after that. And you can eat it or take it home, it doesn't matter. But it was literally overflowing. And he would go and put more and more on there. So we don't just do what the Lord tells us to do. We got to abound more and more. So what does abound mean? It means overflowing. Then we love people, we're really going to love them. And we're going to learn how to love them more and more and more. And as we, as, we, as we execute every principle and precept in the scriptures in our lives, that we go over and beyond. I know when I worked in the secular world, I'm thankful I've been retired from that for a while, but when I worked in the secular world, when I did my work, I looked at opportunities to do more because I understood that was the, what you got rewarded for at work. And so uh, my job, when I know that my, like my first six years, I was a labor rep. I was a labor relations representative. And my job was to handle conflicts between labor and management, between people and their supervisors. And that's what I was to do. Uh, and I had to resolve conflicts between people. That was my job. Well, I didn't just do my job. I went out and part of my job was a supervisor would bring an employee and say, you got a problem on, on this guy's got a problem on his job or she does. And, and I had to take their word for it. So I said, no, 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 I'm not going to just take somebody's word for it. I want to find out the truth. So I went to the engineering department and I learned how to do time studies on jobs. And I learned how to evaluate a job, determine whether or not there was enough work too much or just right. And I would take that knowledge and go back. And then when the supervisor brought him up, I would say, we're going to put this on hold for a day. I'm going to go out and take a look at it so I could do that. I went over and beyond because I didn't have to do that. And I did a number of things that way where I went and learned other parts of the business so I could do my job better. And sometimes I think that we take the requirements or the commandments of God and we sort of run with them. And we think that we're doing the will of God by just doing that. Well, there were things that were lacking in their faith, according to chapter 3 and verse 10. Paul tells them in verse 1, um, he says that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more, more and more. We can never give enough to God. We can't give him enough of our time. We can't give him enough of our talents. We can't give him enough of anything that we have. We can't give him enough. So, our, 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 of course, the Lord wants us to live a life. He put us in this life to interact with other people, to, to work and to associate and to do all these things. But as we do that, we need to exercise the principles of God's word. And he focuses on love here. But loving is certainly one of the principal things we're to do. And we're to love others as Christ loved us. That's quite a task and a command in itself. And we're to continue to do that more and more and more because we haven't perfected exercising the love of God to others. We haven't perfected that. We never will. We haven't perfected it. No matter how much we think we love others, we haven't loved them enough. And that's the thrust of this first verse. We haven't done enough. There's still some things lacking. And so the Lord will tell us through his word, what is it that's lacking? He will tell us that. And as we read and study, the Lord will reveal it unto us. That's part of the miracle that Brother Mark was, was singing about a while ago. And you can't rationalize that. You can't put it down and analyze it mathematically or philosophically. You have to take what God says and understand it. And the understanding comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't have the capacity to know as God knows. 
because his ways are higher than ours. We can't even begin to understand all that God understands, but we ought to seek and to know and to apply in our lives what God will allow us to use. And I believe that it's a true principle of scripture that when we apply ourselves more, God gives us more. James says, if we lack wisdom, pray and God will give us more wisdom and he'll give it liberally, that's abundantly. And so we know that we're lacking wisdom. That's one of the things that we lack. And so we need more wisdom from God. Where do we find it? In the scriptures. I was listening to a preacher this past week, and he said that we ought to make it a practice, and I believe he's right, every day to go into the Proverbs and read some of the Proverbs. They're scriptural truths that are time-tested and perfect in every way. And, we'd be, and, and you, it doesn't require a lot of study. We can go and read a few verses and allow God to speak to us. Allow God to speak to us. And if we're open and receptive, like the Berean believers over in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, they were ready and willing and eager to receive the word, to receive it. And then they checked what others were saying Paul and others who were preaching, they checked to make sure that what he was preaching was in accordance with the scriptures. And they did that daily. They did that daily. Sometimes we think it's too much. And to do that, remember, we need to abound more and more how we ought to walk. The scriptures give us that and we ought to abound more and more. And sometimes we take the pattern of our life and that becomes the plan for our future. We ought not to accept that. We ought to, to disconnect ourselves in some respects from the, from the progress we made in the past to understand there's not a progression like a linear progression. Uh, it, can, it can go, uh, it can abound and jump interlinearly, if you will, into the future if we just avail ourselves of opportunities to allow God to work through us, not as we have in the past, but to abound in those opportunities more and more. And it says, and all of this is to please God. It's all to please God. Everything we do, whatsoever things you do, do all to the glory of God and to his satisfaction and pleasure. So certainly we should, and this is just life in general. In verse two, he says, for we know, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. You know, we know. We've got the scriptures. And you say, well, I don't understand it. Why don't we understand it? Because we have the one who leads and guides us into the truth and gives us an understanding of the scripture living within us. He's called the Holy Spirit. So if there's something lacking in our wisdom, we need to pray and ask God for it. But here's the deal. It's not just a flippant, get it done kind of prayer. We have, to, we have to really and truly, genuinely desire wisdom from God's word so that we can learn to abound more and more in what we do. And again, this is living in general. It applies to every area of our life. Then secondly, uh, Paul focuses on sanctified living. Sanctified is a, is a fancy word for set apart means set apart. Uh, when we're sanctified by God through the shed blood of Christ, as we put our faith in the Lord Jesus, and that sanctification means because we turn from a life of sin in faith towards Christ, then God sanctifies us. He separates us from the bondage of sin. Because before we're saved by the grace of God, we were in bondage to sin. Scriptures are clear. And so that bondage no longer applies. Sin no longer has control over us. But according to Romans, that the one uh, that what that which you serve is is your master. So as we serve sin in our past, sin was our master, literally in bondage to sin. Jesus told the Pharisees in John eight forty four says you are of your you are of your father the devil. Those were the Pharisees and scribes who thought they were God's children. And they said, we're children of Abraham. And Paul, uh, John, uh, and Jesus says, no, you're not children of Abraham. You're children of the devil. He's your father. Now, when we were, in, when we were lost and in our sins, we served sin. And so we were in bondage to sin. But now God has sanctified us. 
He separated us from the bondage. Guess what? We're still in the flesh, so still, sin still has an influence on our life. The devil can still influence us, but he can't control us. James chapter 1 tells us that we have control because that's, that's where we find how sin is conceived in the early verses of, of James chapter 1 and how that sin is conceived is when we're enticed with that bait from the devil and it, it attracts us and we look at it and we behold it and we like it and then we partake of it. It's just like Eve did in the Garden of Eden. She saw the apple, saw the, the, the fruit on the tree, and the Lord had told them not to eat of the fruit of the tree because you're surely going to die. The devil came along and says, surely you're not going to die. You know, he just doesn't want you. To. And so he fed them a lie. They thought about it, and then they jumped head over heel into sin. And that's what we do. And even we've been sanctified, set apart, that is set apart from bondage to sin, we still are under the influence of the devil, and he's still seeking to devour us, according to the writings of Peter. He's a hungry lion just walking about waiting to pounce on us. And what we need to do is, like James said, we need to resist the devil, we need to be humble before God, and we need to draw near to him, resisting the devil. And the only way that happens, if you will, is when we control the influence of sin in our life. It has to be controlled. And we're going to talk more about that in this section. But in verse 3, it says, for this is the will of God. Oh, pay attention whenever the Lord says that, right? For this is the will of God. Even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Fornication is sexual immorality. Um, and inside or outside of marriage, it's sexual immorality. And, uh, and, and there's a word in there that the world doesn't like. It's called abstinence. <laughs> it's called abstinence. I remember uh, preaching at a church back in Virginia Beach, and the chairman of the deacon board, his wife was a member of the Board of Education in Virginia, and they were establishing a very liberal agenda in Virginia, uh, understanding that that agenda was being fed from the folks in Washington, D.C., because the very northern part of Virginia, which is the dominant section of where a lot of the policy and things come out in the state, are right next door. They're influenced. They're part of, it's just called Virginia, but it's still Washington, D.C. Those people that work in D.C., a lot of them live in northern Virginia. So all of those liberal policies were coming down, and she was fully in line with that, and they were trying to propagate uh, uh, that we ought to have sex education in the schools. Boy, we've come a long way from that, and that was 25, 30 years ago, like 25 years ago. And we've come a long way from sex education in the schools. Now we're handing out condoms, and we're fully accepting society is fully accepting people living together outside of wedlock we're fully accepting of that sexual immorality is now because we are to as a society we are to value differences and so if your difference is that you are not married and you're living with somebody that's a difference, and we value that, we treasure that, we embrace it, we wrap our arms around it, and we encourage you, we support you, and we love you. No, we don't do that as Christians. That's what the world's doing. So sexual immorality is something which is legal today. I remember it used to be illegal, even in, in my lifetime. It's legal today, but not only has it been legalized, it has thoroughly been accepted by the majority of, our, of the people in our nation. And it's, it's that which not only is legalized and accepted, but it's a desired state among so many people. I've heard people say, introduce, say, this is my fiance. You know what fiance means to a lot of people today? It's not like when uh, Mary and I got engaged, um, you know, two years before we got married, and she was my fiance for two years. Uh, we were abstinence all over. But the thing is, the world today, when you start living with somebody, they become your fiancé. It's, it's just a more socially acceptable way of saying, this is my live-in, right? My fiancé, my girlfriend, my boyfriend. 
That's how we characterize that. But immorality is running rampant. It was rampant in the days when Paul was preaching to the churches. And it's no different. In fact, Timothy was instructed by Paul that it's going to get worse and worse as the days go by and as the years go by, and it has gotten much worse. So, for this that was given to the Thessalonians before it was much worse as it is today, uh, the emphasis was upon sanctification that you should abstain from sexual immorality. This is one example. And it's in verse 4 that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. The word possess means to control. Uh, vessel is a word for body. How to control your body. How to control your body. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth because they were also involved in sexual immorality. And he told them in chapter 7, the whole chapter 7 is about if you can't control your body, you need to get married. If you can't control yourself, get married. And says there are some people who have the gift of being single, and so that's fine. And in fact, you're better off if you're single. If, if you have the gift, you're better off because you don't have the distractions of marriage and children and all the things that go along with that uh, from your attendance to the Lord. But if you're married, it's okay too, right? If you're married, you still need to do that understanding that you've got some other baggage to deal with other than just service to the Lord. Now you've got a family to care for. You have to provide for your family. You've got you to you you nurture your family. And that brings a whole host of responsibilities. It's almost as if the world can't contain the books that are written on how to raise children. Right? Because we have trouble. So, uh, but sexual immorality is a reality. It's a reality. It's a reality that everybody deals with either directly or indirectly. It's in all of our families to some extent. But we ought to know how, how to control our body and to honor God in so doing. So in verse 5, not, not in the lust, and this lust is a strong desire, and sexual immorality is perhaps where the strongest desires come into play in a person's life. Not in the lust of concupiscence. Concupiscence means sensuality. It's directly, it's the essence of uh, sexual immorality. That's sensuality. Not, we're not to in, indulge in these strong desires around sexuality or sensuality because the Gentiles do that. The Gentiles do that. They don't know God. But in verse 6, that no man go beyond and defraud, defraud his brother in any way, in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. So destructive, that speaks of destructive social and spiritual consequences of an immoral life. And so in verse 7, the Lord says, for God, through Paul, says, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. And so if we're going to be holy, we have to control our body. Abstinence is the only way to control your body regarding sexual immorality. It's abstinence. And of course, uh, in, in Hebrews, it tells us that the marriage bed is honorable. And so we understand that within the context of marriage, there is no sexual immorality. But that's the only place, it's that God-given uh, privilege to marry and to recreate, right? To have children and, and, and to be. And the, the scriptures talk about the family. Ephesians chapter 5 and chapter 6 talk about how the husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church. How the women are to be submissive to their husbands. How the parents should not be overbearing on their children in Ephesians chapter 6. And, and it even goes into chapter 6 in Ephesians. talks about our work life and how in our work life we're to serve our masters as if we're serving the Lord. Serve our bosses. So we have responsibilities to the Lord and we need to, to, to eliminate, if you will, all of these destructive behaviors in our life because God has not called us to this sinful, unclean life, but unto holiness. When we think about holiness, it's the very essence of God. It's perfection at its very best. And this is why it's so important to know the Word of God because when we know the Word of God, we believe the Word of God, we accept the Word of God, and we 
determine within our own um, uh, our own uh, essence, if you will, that we're going to put faith in Christ. That means that however, however God wants us to live our lives, we're going to live it that way because he is holy and just. And we want to be like God. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1 says we need to imitate God. Imitate God. Wow. That is our role model. Christ himself. And how he walked on this earth. The, anything short of that is not pleasing to God. We need to go, and it, it's, it's because in 1 John chapter 1, it doesn't say, well, if you sin along the way, it's okay, just as long as you're still making progress. No. It says if you sin along the way, you need to confess those sins. 1 John 1, verses 8 and 9 and 10. If you sin along the way, you need to confess those sins because God hates sin. And so, yes, we are going to mess up. But the, here's, the, here's the success formula. We are going to mess up. When we mess up, we confess it to God. God forgives it. And when we, when we confess it, it needs to be like David in Psalm 51 with a heart of contrition. And that is not to ever desire to go back into that thing again. No. Rejecting that as being acceptable because it's not pleasing to God. And as we continue to do that for the, the aspect after aspect of our life, then we draw closer to God. Then we get closer to Him. So, and you say, well, how can I do that? Verse 8. He therefore that despiseth, that is, rejects uh, the, the precepts of God, you despise not man, but God, who hath also given unto us His Holy Spirit. Every enablement to accomplish the will of God and to please Him comes through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. So we want to control in this aspect that's discussed, we want to control sexual immorality. It comes by controlling our body under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit. And you say, what does that mean? Because we say, you know, at our house and we're tempted and we say, okay, Holy Spirit, take control. Not exactly the way it goes, right? Uh, we have to be desirous to please God in everything that we do. So the Holy Spirit's role is this. He enables us because when we go to do that something wrong, if we're believers, He's going to remind us through our conscience, that's wrong. When we receive the warnings, it's time to stop. Don't go on with that desire the devil's going to try to entice us. Put the bait out there. It's going to look good. And then the control is, okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to seek to please God here. The Holy Spirit's sending up some warning signals not to go there. So I'm going to please the Lord in this matter. And I'm just not going to do it. But we have to have that heart of contrition that we're not willing to even go back into the same area. So then in the last part of this, I call it disciplined living. Disciplined living. Um, and uh, this disciplined living uh, comes in verse 9 as a beginning. But as touching brotherly love. So he talked about sexual immorality. I said that's one example. Here's another example. Brotherly love. We talked about this this morning. And Ephesians 4.32 that says that we're to love one another as Christ loved us. As God loved us, we are to love others. When we think about loving others, many times we do it based on what other people do, based on what we think is enough, right? That's enough. But we need to love as Christ loved us. How did Christ love us? How did God love us? If Romans uh, uh, 5, 8 says that God commended his love towards us while we're yet sinners. So while people are yet doing the, the, the wrong thing, we're still going to love them. We're still going to love them. And we're going to abound more and more. And we'll see that in here as well. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is guiding and directing you into the truth if you're seeking the will of God. It says, you don't even need that I write unto you, for you yourselves are taught of God. Who's our teacher? The Holy Spirit. You yourselves are taught of God. So this is a learned behavior to control ourselves and to submit ourselves to God. 
so that our lives reflect the holiness of God as we try to imitate that life of Christ who said, I came not to do my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And we need to remember in Matthew 7, 21, where it says, not everyone that calls unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those who do my Father's will, the Lord said. So it's the doing of the will of God. That's what we need to do. And this comes as the ability and knowledge of that is as we are taught of God. Because God teaches us. He teaches us how to do it. We have the Holy Spirit who brings to our understanding what God says. He gives us discernment in situations to detect whether or not we're doing right or wrong. That's the Holy Spirit. And he leads and guides us. And as, as, as we receive the wisdom of God, how we ought to live our lives, it comes through the instruction to us through God's word. You were taught of God to love one another. We're taught of God to do all aspects of our life. When we were just a baby, we were not a righteous, holy baby. We were not. <laughs> Just ask any mother, right? We're not a righteous, holy baby. And, and typically, our life goes downhill from that point because we get deeper and deeper into sin. Because we make conscious decisions to involve ourselves in sin. We make conscious decisions to do that. And then the Lord strikes us off an animal like he did Paul one day. And he strikes us down and we understand the need of salvation because we're a sinner in the hands of an angry God. And so we put our faith in Christ, having turned from our sins, and God saves us by His grace, and now we need to control ourselves and not fall prey to every enticement that comes our way. We need to control ourselves, and we're taught of God how to do that, including how to love one another as Christ loved us. Wow. So then, in verse 10, just in... And, 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 you know, verse 9 is enough to challenge the best of us to a high degree. And when you look to verse 10, you see how much more serious it is. And indeed, you do it toward all the brethren. Oh, by the way, I love this word all. You do it to all the brethren. You do what? You love them as God loves you. You do it to all the brethren. Get that? All the brethren. It's there for a reason. What that means is we can't selectively choose who to love as God loved us. We don't get to select who they are. We don't just get a circle of friends and love them as God loved us. Or maybe a wider circle of friends that includes acquaintances. But we're to love others. And we even understand that the Good Samaritan was an example of how we ought to love our neighbors. Right? who went out of his way when the religious folks wouldn't even deal with it, right? But the Samaritan, who wasn't even Jewish, he goes over and he takes care of this guy that's in need. That's the love. And that's the demonstration. That's the example of the demonstration of love, loving others as God loved us. Because somebody asked the Lord, who's our neighbor? It's the person you don't even know who's in need. That's who it is. And we're to love others as it says to love one another and you do it towards all the brethren don't show partiality in love james says that it's a sin to do that we can't be partial we can't discriminate we do it to all the brethren who are in all macedonia but we beseech you brethren that you oh boy increase more and more in what in your love to others <clears throat> to which others all of them all of them. I don't see an exception in the word all. It's all. We don't get to discriminate. We don't get to show partiality. We don't get to be prejudiced. And verse 11 sort of puts the cap on this. <clears throat> and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. So we're going to increase more and more their love, our compassion, our tender heartedness towards others. And we're going to lead a quiet life. A quiet life is someone who doesn't present social problems all around them. They don't generate conflict among other people. 
they're sort of resting easy, if you will, even in the face of difficulty, having this contentment that no matter what state we find ourselves in, right? And we're going to do our own work with our own hands. Speaking actually of manual labor here, I don't know if you ever do manual labor. Some people, I had a job where I sat in an office and what I did when I got home is I did manual labor. Manual labor is good for us. I enjoy doing it. Doing something physical with yourself, it's good. But it says, study to be quiet. Again, the word study doesn't mean study like we know it today. The word literally means make it your objective. Make it your aim. Make it your purpose. What should we make our purpose to lead a quiet life? Do our own business. Mind our own business. Do our own work. Sometimes we're meddling so much in other people's affairs that we create a lot of interest and many times conflict in other people's lives. And we stir things up and, we, and, and, and rumors get spread and all that stuff. We need to lead a quiet life. And in verse 12, um, we need to win the respect of unbelievers living a disciplined life. Talk about that disciplined living. It says there in verse 12 that... Uh, it means why? That you may walk honestly toward them that are without. Those that are without are those that are unbelievers. That you walk honestly toward them that are literally unbelievers and that you may have lack of nothing. That's how you have lack of nothing. You live your self, live our lives in a disciplined manner, separated through sanctified living. Understanding that God's going to give us every capability if we seek to do His will and to please Him. Let's stand together. Father, we thank You for Your love and Your mercy, for Your grace. We thank You for the instruction this morning. We thank You for Your Word, <clears throat> how powerful it is. And... We just pray that that wisdom that we've gleaned this morning will not be the extent of our seeking a new disciplined and sanctified life in this coming year. But Father, we will continue that we will continue to study your word, to examine it, uh, to partake of it, to be fed. Lord, we don't know how we should live our life well enough because we know there are things that are lacking in our life things that would please you are lacking things that you desire and require of us are lacking so father may we may we give of ourselves not only to you but to your word and may our purpose be um, uh, to 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 receive that which you give to us receive correction wherein we've taken a wrong position to receive rebuke for things that we've done wrong for the sins in our life, that we might confess them, to receive encouragement from Your Word, and that we'd be strengthened in areas where we're performing in a manner that's pleasing, that we get better and better, and that we increase more and more. Father, may this be the pattern of our Christian life in this next year. And may it be the beginning as You tarry with, for a string of years for us to continue to grow and mature in Christ. And we'll give you praise and thanks for all you do in our life, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.